Chapter One of Out of Time's Abyss. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ralph Snelson. Out of Time's Abyss by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter One. This is the tale of Bradley after he left Fort Dinosaur upon the west coast of the great lake that is in the center of the island. Upon the fourth day of September, 1916, he set out with four companions, Sinclair, Brady, James, and Tippet, to search along the base of the barrier cliffs for a point at which they might be scaled. Through the heavy Caspakian air, beneath the swollen sun, the five men marched northwest from Fort Dinosaur, now waist-deep in lush jungle grasses, starred with myriad gorgeous blooms, now across open meadowland and park-like expanses, and again plunging into dense forests of eucalyptus and acacia and giant arboreous ferns with feathered fronds waving gently a hundred feet above their heads. About them, upon the ground, among the trees, and in the air over them, moved and swung and soared the countless forms of Caspak's teeming life. Always were they menaced by some frightful thing, and seldom were their rifles cool. Yet even in the brief time they had dwelt upon Caprona, they had become callous to danger, so that they swung along laughing and chatting like soldiers on a summer hike. This reminds me of South Clark Street remarked Brady, who had once served on the traffic squad in Chicago, and, as no one asked him why, he volunteered that it was because it's no place for an Irishman. South Clark Street and Heaven have something in common, then, suggested Sinclair. James and Tippet laughed, and then a hideous growl broke from a dense thicket ahead and diverted their attention to other matters. "'One of them behemoths of holy writ,' muttered Tippet, as they came to a halt, and with guns ready awaited the almost inevitable charge. "'Hungry lot of beggars, these,' said Bradley, "'always trying to eat everything they see.' For a moment no further sound came from the thicket. "'He may be feeding now,' suggested Bradley. "'We'll try to go around him. Can't waste ammunition. Won't last forever. Follow me.' and he set off at right angles to their former course, hoping to avert a charge. They had taken a dozen steps, perhaps, when the thicket moved to the advance of the thing within it, the leafy branches parted, and the hideous head of a gigantic bear emerged. "'Pick your trees,' whispered Bradley. "'Can't waste ammunition.' The men looked about them. The bear took a couple of steps forward, still growling menacingly. He was exposed to the shoulders now. Tippet took one look at the monster and bolted for the nearest tree, and then the bear charged. He charged straight for Tippet. The other men scattered for the various trees they had selected, all except Bradley. He stood watching Tippet and the bear. The man had a good start, and the tree was not far away, but the speed of the enormous creature behind him was something to marvel at. Yet Tippet was in a fair way to make his sanctuary when his foot caught in a tangle of roots and down he went, his rifle flying from his hand and falling several yards away. Instantly Bradley's piece was at his shoulder. There was a sharp report answered by a roar of mingled rage and pain from the carnivore. Tippet attempted to scramble to his feet. "'Lie still!' shouted Bradley. "'Can't waste ammunition!' The bear halted in its tracks, wheeled toward Bradley, and then back again toward Tippet. Again the former's rifle spit angrily, and the bear turned again in his direction. Bradley shouted loudly, "'Come on, you behemoth of holy writ!' he cried. "'Come on, you duffer! Can't waste ammunition!' And as he saw the bear apparently upon the verge of deciding to charge him, he encouraged the idea by backing rapidly away knowing that an angry beast will more often charge one who moves than one who lies still. And the bear did charge. Like a bolt of lightning he flashed down upon the Englishman. "'Now run!' Bradley called to Tippet, and himself turned in flight toward a nearby tree. The other men, now safely ensconced upon various branches, watched the race with breathless interest. Would Bradley make it? It seemed scarce possible. And if he didn't, James gasped at the thought. 
Six feet at the shoulder stood the frightful mountain of blood-mad flesh and bone and sinew that was bearing down with the speed of an express train upon the seemingly slow-moving man. It all happened in a few seconds, but they were seconds that seemed like hours to the men who watched. They saw Tippet leap to his feet at Bradley's shouted warning. They saw him run, stooping to recover his rifle as he passed the spot where it had fallen. They saw him glance back toward Bradley, and then they saw him stop short of the tree that might have given him safety, and turn back in the direction of the bear. Firing as he ran, Tippet raced after the great cave bear, the monstrous thing that should have been extinct ages before, ran for it, and fired even as the beast was almost upon Bradley. The men in the trees scarcely breathed. It seemed to them such a futile thing for Tippet to do, and Tippet of all men. They had never looked upon Tippet as a coward. There seemed to be no cowards among that strangely assorted company that fate had gathered together from the four corners of the earth, but Tippet was considered a cautious man, overcautious, some thought him. How futile he and his little pop-gun appeared as he dashed after that living engine of destruction. But, oh, how glorious! It was some such thought as this that ran through Brady's mind, though articulated it might have been expressed otherwise, albeit more forcefully. Just then it occurred to Brady to fire, and he, too, opened upon the bear. But at the same instant the animal stumbled and fell forward, though still growling most fearsomely. Tippet never stopped running or firing until he stood within a foot of the brute, which lay almost touching Bradley, and was already struggling to regain its feet. Placing the muzzle of his gun against the bear's ear, Tippet pulled the trigger. The creature sank limply to the ground, and Bradley scrambled to his feet. "'Good work, Tippet,' he said. "'Mightily obliged to you. Awful waste of ammunition, really.' and then they resumed the march, and in fifteen minutes the encounter had ceased even to be a topic of conversation. For two days they continued upon their perilous way. Already the cliffs loomed high and forbidding close ahead, without sign of break to encourage hope that somewhere they might be scaled. Late in the afternoon the party crossed a small stream of warm water, upon the sluggishly moving surface of which floated countless millions of tiny green eggs, surrounded by a light scum of the same color, though of a darker shade. Their past experience of Caspak had taught them that they might expect to come upon a stagnant pool of warm water if they followed the stream to its source, but there they were, almost certain to find some of Caspak's grotesque, man-like creatures, already since they had disembarked from the U-33 after its perilous trip through the subterranean channel beneath the barrier cliffs had brought them into the inland sea of Caspak, had they encountered what had appeared to be three distinct types of these creatures. There had been the pure apes, huge, gorilla-like beasts, and those who walked a trifle more erect, and had features with just a shade more of the human cast about them. Then there were men like Om, whom they had captured and confined at the fort, Om the club man, well-known club man, Tyler had called him. Om and his people had knowledge of speech. They had a language in which they were unlike the race just inferior to them, and they walked much more erect, and were less hairy but it was principally the fact that they possessed a spoken language and carried a weapon that differentiated them from the others. All of these peoples had proven belligerent in the extreme. In common with the rest of the fauna of Caprona, the first law of nature, as they seemed to understand it, was to kill, kill, kill. And so it was that Bradley had no desire to follow up the little stream toward the pool near which were sure to be the caves of some savage tribe. But fortune played him an unkind trick, for the pool was much closer than he imagined, its southern end reaching fully a mile south of the point at which they crossed the stream. And so it was that after forcing their way through a tangle of jungle vegetation, they came out upon the edge of the pool which they had wished to avoid. Almost simultaneously there appeared south of them a party of naked men armed with clubs and hatchets. Both parties halted as they caught sight of one another. The men from the fort saw before them a hunting party, 
evidently returning to its caves or village laden with meat. They were large men with features closely resembling those of the African negro, though their skins were white. Short hair grew upon a large portion of their limbs and bodies, which still retained a considerable trace of apish progenitors. They were, however, a distinctly higher type than the bolu or club men. Bradley would have been glad to have averted a meeting, but as he desired to lead his party south around the end of the pool, and as it was hemmed in by the jungle on one side and the water on the other, there seemed no escape from an encounter. On the chance that he might avoid a clash, Bradley stepped forward with upraised hand. "'We are friends,' he called in the tongue of Om, the Bolu who had been held prisoner at the fort. "'Permit us to pass in peace. We will not harm you.' At this the hatchet-men set up a great jabbering with much laughter, loud and boisterous, no shouted one you will not harm us for we shall kill you come we kill we kill and with hideous shouts they charged down upon the europeans sinclair you may fire said bradley quietly pick off the leader can't waste ammunition the englishman raised his piece to his shoulder and took quick aim at the breast of the yelling savage leaping toward them Directly behind the leader came another hatchet man, and with the report of Sinclair's rifle both warriors lunged forward in the tall grass, pierced by the same bullet. The effect upon the rest of the band was electrical. As one man they came to a sudden halt, wheeled to the east, and dashed into the jungle, where the men could hear them forcing their way in an effort to put as much distance as possible between themselves and the authors of this new and frightful noise that killed warriors at a great distance. Both the savages were dead when Bradley approached to examine them, and as the Europeans gathered round, other eyes were bent upon them with greater curiosity than they displayed for the victim of Sinclair's bullet. When the party again took up the march around the southern end of the pool, the owner of the eyes followed them, large round eyes, almost expressionless, except for a certain cold cruelty which glinted malignly from under their pale gray irises. All unconscious of the stalker, the men came late in the afternoon to a spot which seemed favorable as a campsite. A cold spring bubbled from the base of a rocky formation which overhung and partially encircled a small enclosure. At Bradley's command, the men took up the duties assigned them, gathering wood, building a cook fire, and preparing the evening meal. It was while they were thus engaged that Brady's attention was attracted by the dismal flapping of huge wings. He glanced up, expecting to see one of the great flying reptiles of a bygone age, his rifle ready in his hand. Brady was a brave man. He had groped his way up narrow tenement stairs and taken an armed maniac from a dark room without turning a hair. But now, as he looked up, he went white and staggered back. God! he almost screamed. What is it? Attracted by Brady's cry, the others seized their rifles as they followed his wide-eyed, frozen gaze nor was there one of them that was not moved by some species of terror or awe. Then Brady spoke again in an almost inaudible voice. Holy Mother, protect us! It's a banshee! Bradley, always cool, almost to indifference in the face of danger, felt a strange creeping sensation run over his flesh, as slowly, not a hundred feet above them, the thing flapped itself across the sky its huge round eyes glaring down upon them, and until it disappeared over the tops of the trees of a nearby wood, the five men stood as though paralyzed, their eyes never leaving the weird shape, nor never one of them appearing to recall that he grasped a loaded rifle in his hands. With the passing of the thing came the reaction. Tippet sank to the ground and buried his face in his hands. Oh, God, he moaned, Take me away from this order for police. Brady, who recovered from the first shock, swore loud and luridly. He called upon all the saints to witness that he was unafraid, and that anybody with half an eye could have seen that the creature was nothing more than one of the flying alligators that they all were familiar with. Yes, said Sinclair, with fine sarcasm, 
We've saw so many of them with white shrouds on them. Shut up, you fool, growled Brady. If you know so much, tell us what it was after being then. Then he turned toward Bradley. What was it, sir, do you think? he asked. Bradley shook his head. I don't know, he said. It looked like a winged human being clothed in a flowing white robe. Its face was more human than otherwise. That is the way it looked to me. But what it really was I can't even guess, for such a creature is as far beyond my experience or knowledge as it is beyond yours. All that I am sure of is that whatever else it may have been, it was quite material. It was no ghost, rather just another of the strange forms of life which we have met here, and with which we should be accustomed by this time. Tippet looked up, his face still ashy. "'You can't tell me,' he cried. "'I seen it. Blimey, I seen it. It was a dead man flying through the hair. Didn't I see his eyes? Oh, good, didn't I see him? "'It didn't look like any beast or reptile to me,' spoke up Sinclair. "'It was looking right down at me when I looked up, and I saw its face plain as I see yours. It had big round eyes that looked all cold and dead, and its cheeks were sunken in deep and I could see its yellow teeth behind thin, tight-drawn lips, like a man who had been dead a long while, sir, he added, turning toward Bradley. Yes, James had not spoken since the apparition had passed over them, and now it was scarce speech which he uttered, rather a series of articulate gasps. Yes, dead, a, a long while. It means something. It come for some one, for one of us. One of us is going to die. I'm going to die, he ended in a wail. Come, come, snapped Bradley. Won't do, won't do at all. Get to work, all of you. Waste of time, can't waste time. His authoritative tones brought them all up standing, and presently each was occupied with his own duties, but each worked in silence, and there was no singing and no bantering such as had marked the making of previous camps not until they had eaten and to each had been issued the little ration of smoking tobacco allowed after each evening meal did any sign of a relaxation of taut nerves appear it was brady who showed the first signs of returning good spirits he commenced humming it's a long way to tipperary and presently to voice the words but he was well into his third song before anyone joined him and even then there seemed a dismal note in even the gayest of tunes a huge fire blazed in the opening of their rocky shelter that the prowling carnivora might be kept at bay, and always one man stood on guard, watchfully alert against a sudden rush by some maddened beast of the jungle. Beyond the fire yellow-green spots of flame appeared, moved restlessly about, disappeared and reappeared, accompanied by a hideous chorus of screams and growls and roars, as the hungry meat-eaters hunting through the night were attracted by the light or the scent of possible prey. But to such sights and sounds as these the five men had become callous. They sang or talked as unconcernedly as they might have done in the bar-room of some public-house at home. Sinclair was standing guard. The others were listening to Brady's description of traffic congestion at the Rush Street Bridge during the rush hour at night. The fire crackled cheerily. The owners of the yellow-green eyes raised their frightful chorus to the heavens. Conditions seemed again to have returned to normal. And then, as though the hand of death had reached out and touched them all, the five men tensed into sudden rigidity. Above the nocturnal diapason of the teeming jungle sounded a dismal flapping of wings, and overhead through the thick night a shadowy form passed across the diffused light of the flaring campfire. Sinclair raised his rifle and fired. An eerie wail floated down from above, and the apparition, whatever it might have been, was swallowed by the darkness. For several seconds the listening men heard the sound of those dismally flapping wings lessening in the distance until they could no longer be heard. Bradley was the first to speak. "'Shouldn't have fired, Sinclair,' he said. "'Can't waste ammunition.' But there was no note of censure in his tone. 
It was as though he understood the nervous reaction that had compelled the other's act. "'I couldn't help it, sir,' said Sinclair. "'Lord, it would take an iron man to keep from shooting at that awful thing. Do you believe in ghosts, sir?' "'No,' replied Bradley. "'No such things.' "'I don't know about that,' said Brady. "'There was a woman murdered over on the prairie near Brighton. Her throat was cut from ear to ear and—' "'Shut up,' snapped Bradley. "'My granddaddy used to live down Coppington. Why?' said Tippet. "'They were a old ruined castle on a hill nearby, and at midnight they used to see pale blue lights through the windows and air—' "'Will you close your hatch?' demanded Bradley. "'You fools will have yourselves scared to death in a minute. Now go to sleep.' But there was little sleep in camp that night, until utter exhaustion overtook the harassed men toward morning nor was there any return of the weird creature that had set the nerves of each of them on edge. The following forenoon the party reached the base of the barrier cliffs, and for two days marched northward in an effort to discover a break in the frowning abutment that raised its rocky face almost perpendicularly above them. Yet nowhere was there the slightest indication that the cliffs were scalable. Disheartened, Bradley determined to turn back toward the fort, as he already had exceeded the time decided upon by Bowen Tyler and himself for the expedition. The cliffs for many miles had been trending in a northeasterly direction, indicating to Bradley that they were approaching the northern extremity of the island. According to the best of his calculations, they had made sufficient easting during the past two days to have brought them to a point almost directly north of Fort Dinosaur, and as nothing could be gained by retracing their steps along the base of the cliffs, he decided to strike due south through the unexplored country between them and the fort. That night, September 9, 1916, they made camp a short distance from the cliffs beside one of the numerous cool springs that are to be found within Caspak, oftentimes close beside the still more numerous warm and hot springs which feed the many pools. After supper the men lay smoking and chatting among themselves. Tippet was on guard. Fewer night prowlers threatened them, and the men were commenting upon the fact that the farther north they had traveled the smaller the number of all species of animals became, though it was still present in what would have seemed appalling plenitude in any other part of the world. The diminution in reptilian life was the most noticeable change in the fauna of northern Caspak. Here, however, were forms they had not met elsewhere, several of which were of gigantic proportions. According to their custom, all, with the exception of the man on guard, sought sleep early, nor once disposed upon the ground for slumber were they long in finding it. It seemed to Bradley that he had scarcely closed his eyes when he was brought to his feet wide awake by a piercing scream which was punctuated by the sharp report of a rifle from the direction of the fire where Tippet stood guard. As he ran toward the man, Bradley heard above him the same uncanny wail that had set every nerve on edge several nights before, and the dismal flapping of huge wings. He did not need to look up at the white shrouded figure winging slowly away into the night to know that their grim visitor had returned. The muscles of his arm reacting to the sight and sound of the menacing form carried his hand to the butt of his pistol, but after he had drawn the weapon he immediately returned it to its holster with a shrug. "'What for?' he muttered. "'Can't waste ammunition.' Then he walked quickly to where Tippet lay sprawled upon his face. By this time James, Brady, and Sinclair were at his heels, each with his rifle in readiness. "'Is he dead, sir?' whispered James, as Bradley kneeled beside the prostrate form. Bradley turned Tippet over on his back and pressed an ear close to the other's heart. In a moment he raised his head. "'Fainted,' he announced. "'Get water. Hurry.' Then he loosened Tippet's shirt at the throat, and when the water was brought threw a cupful in the man's face. Slowly Tippet regained consciousness and sat up. At first he looked curiously into the faces of the men about him, then an expression of terror overspread his features. He shot a startled glance up into the black void above, and then burying his face in his arms began to sob like a child. 
"'What's wrong, mon?' demanded Bradley. "'Buck up. Can't play cry, baby. Waste of energy. What happened?' "'What happened, sir?' wailed Tibbet. "'Oh, good, sir! It came back! It came for me, sir! Right it did, sir! Straight hot me, sir! Hand with long white hands, and it clawed for me! Oh, good! It almost caught me, sir! I'm as good as dead! I'm a marked man! That's what I am! It was a garden for a care me horf, sir!' "'Stuff and nonsense!' snapped Bradley. "'Did you get a good look at it?' Tippet said that he did, a much better look than he wanted. The thing had almost clutched him, and he had looked straight into its eyes. "'Dead eyes in the dead face!' he had described them. "'What was it after being, do you think?' inquired Brady. "'It was death!' moaned Tippet, shuddering, and again a pall of gloom fell upon the little party. The following day Tippet walked as one in a trance. He never spoke except in reply to a direct question, which more often than not had to be repeated before it could attract his attention. He insisted that he was already a dead man, for if the thing didn't come for him during the day he would never live through another night of agonized apprehension, waiting for the frightful end that he was positive was in store for him. "'I'll see to that,' he said, and they all knew that Tippet meant to take his own life before darkness set in. Bradley tried to reason with him, in his short, crisp way, but soon saw the futility of it, nor could he take the man's weapons from him without subjecting him to almost certain death from any of the numberless dangers that beset their way. The entire party was moody and glum. There was none of the bantering that had marked their intercourse before, even in the face of blighting hardships and hideous danger. This was a new menace that threatened them, something that they couldn't explain, and so naturally it aroused within them superstitious fear which Tippet's attitude only tended to augment. To add further to their gloom, their way led through a dense forest, where, on account of the underbrush, it was difficult to make even a mile an hour. Constant watchfulness was required to avoid the many snakes of various degrees of repulsiveness and enormity that infested the wood, and the only ray of hope they had to cling to was that the forest would, like the majority of Caspakian forests, prove to be of no considerable extent. Bradley was in the lead when he came suddenly upon a grotesque creature of titanic proportions, Crouching among the trees, which here commenced to thin out slightly, Bradley saw what appeared to be an enormous dragon devouring the carcass of a mammoth. From frightful jaws to the tip of its long tail, it was fully forty feet in length. Its body was covered with plates of thick skin, which bore a striking resemblance to armor plate. The creature saw Bradley almost at the same instant that he saw it, and reared up on its enormous hind legs until its head towered a full twenty-five feet above the ground. From the cavernous jaws issued a hissing sound of a volume equal to the escaping steam from the safety valves of half a dozen locomotives, and then the creature came for the man. Scatter! shouted Bradley to those behind him, and all but Tippet heeded the warning. The man stood as though dazed, and when Bradley saw the other's danger, he too stopped, and wheeling about sent a bullet into the massive body, forcing its way through the trees toward him. The shot struck the creature in the belly where there was no protecting armor, eliciting a new note which rose in a shrill whistle and ended in a wail. It was then that Tippet appeared to come out of his trance, for with a cry of terror he turned and fled to the left. Bradley, seeing that he had as good an opportunity as the others to escape, now turned his attention to extricating himself, and as the wood seemed dense on the right, he ran in that direction, hoping that the close-set boles would prevent pursuit on the part of the great reptile. The dragon paid no further attention to him, however, for Tippet's sudden break for liberty had attracted its attention and after Tippet it went, bowling over small trees, uprooting underbrush, and leaving a wake behind it like that of a small tornado. Bradley, the moment he had discovered the thing was pursuing Tippet, had followed it. He was afraid to fire, for fear of hitting the man, 
and so it was that he came upon them at the very moment that the monster lunged its great weight forward upon the doomed man. The sharp three-toed talons of the forelimb seized poor Tippet, and Bradley saw the unfortunate fellow lifted high above the ground as the creature again reared up on its hind legs, immediately transferring Tippet's body to its gaping jaws, which closed with a sickening, crunching sound as Tippet's bones cracked beneath the great teeth. Bradley half raised his rifle to fire again, and then lowered it with a shake of his head. Tippet was beyond succor. Why waste a bullet that Caspak could never replace? If he could now escape the further notice of the monster, it would be a wiser act than to throw his life away in futile revenge. He saw that the reptile was not looking in his direction, and so he slipped noiselessly behind the bole of a large tree, and thence quietly faded away in the direction he believed the others to have taken. At what he considered a safe distance he halted and looked back. Half hidden by the intervening trees, he still could see the huge head and the massive jaws from which protruded the limp legs of the dead man. Then, as though struck by the hammer of Thor, the creature collapsed and crumpled to the ground. Bradley's single bullet, penetrating the body through the soft skin of the belly, had slain the titan. A few minutes later Bradley found the others of the party. The four returned cautiously to the spot where the creature lay, and after convincing themselves that it was quite dead, came close to it. It was an arduous and gruesome job extricating Tippet's mangled remains from the powerful jaws, the men working for the most part silently. "'It was the work of the banshee, all right,' muttered Brady. "'It warned poor Tippet, it did. It killed him. That's what it did.' "'And it'll kill some more of us,' said James, his lower lip trembling. "'If it was a ghost,' interjected Sinclair, "'and I don't say as it was, but if it was, "'why it could take on any form it wanted to. "'It might have turned itself into this thing, "'which ain't no natural thing at all, just to get poor Tippet. "'If it had been a lion or something else human-like, "'it wouldn't look so strange. "'But this here thing ain't human-like. "'There ain't no such thing and never was.' "'Bullets don't kill ghosts,' said Bradley, "'so this couldn't have been a ghost. "'Furthermore, there are no such things. "'I've been trying to place this creature. "'Just succeeded. "'It's a Tyrannosaurus. "'Saw a picture of skeleton in magazine. "'There's one in New York Natural History Museum. "'Seems to me it's said it was found in place called Hell Creek, "'somewhere in western North America.' supposed to have lived about six million years ago. Hell Creek's in Montana, said Sinclair. I used to punch cows in Wyoming, and I've heard of Hell Creek. Do you suppose that there are things six million years old? His tone was skeptical. No, replied Bradley, but it would indicate that the island of Caprona has stood almost without change for more than six million years. The conversation and Bradley's assurance that the creature was not of supernatural origin helped to raise a trifle the spirits of the men, and then came another diversion in the form of ravenous meat-eaters attracted to the spot by the uncanny sense of smell which had apprised them of the presence of flesh, killed and ready for the eating. It was a constant battle while they dug a grave and consigned all that was mortal of John Tippet to his last lonely resting place. Nor would they leave then, but remain to fashion a rude headstone from a crumbling outcropping of sandstone, and to gather a mass of the gorgeous flowers growing in such a great profusion around them, and heap the new-made grave with bright blooms. Upon the headstone Sinclair scratched in rude characters the words, here lies John Tippet, Englishman, killed by Tyrannosaurus, 10 September, A.D. 1916, R.I.P. And Bradley repeated a short prayer before they left their comrade forever. For three days the party marched due south through forests and meadowland and great park-like areas where countless herbivorous animals grazed deer and antelope and bows and the little eka, the smallest species of Caspakian horse, about the size of a rabbit. 
There were other horses, too, but all were small, the largest being not above eight hands in height. Preying continually upon the herbivora were the meat-eaters, large and small, wolves, hyenodons, panthers, lions, tigers, and bear, as well as several large and ferocious species of reptilian life. On September 12th the party scaled a line of sandstone cliffs which crossed their route toward the south, but they crossed them only after an encounter with the tribe that inhabited the numerous caves which pitted the face of the escarpment. That night they camped upon a rocky plateau which was sparsely wooded with jara, and here once again they were visited by the weird nocturnal apparition that had already filled them with a nameless terror. As on the night of September ninth, the first warning came from the sentinel standing guard over his sleeping companions. A terror-stricken cry punctuated by the crack of a rifle brought Bradley, Sinclair, and Brady to their feet in time to see James, with clubbed rifle, battling with a white-robed figure that hovered on widespread wings on a level with the Englishman's head. As they ran shouting forward it was obvious to them that the weird and terrible apparition was attempting to seize James, but when it saw the others coming to his rescue it desisted, flapping rapidly upward and away, its long, ragged wings giving forth the peculiarly dismal notes which always characterized the sound of its flying. Bradley fired at the vanishing menacer of their peace and safety, but whether he scored a hit or not none could tell, though following the shot there was wafted back to them the same piercing wail that had on other occasions frozen their marrow. Then they turned toward James, who lay face downward upon the ground, trembling as with ague, but for a time he could not even speak, but at last regained sufficient composure to tell them how the thing must have swooped silently upon him from above and behind as the first premonition of danger he had received was when the long claw-like fingers had clutched him beneath either arm. In the melee his rifle had been discharged, and he had broken away at the same instant and turned to defend himself with the butt. The rest they had seen. From that instant James was an absolutely broken man. He maintained with shaking lips that his doom was sealed, that the thing had marked him for its own, and that he was as good as dead, nor could any amount of argument or raillery convince him to the contrary. He had seen Tippet marked and claimed, and now he had been marked nor were his constant reiterations of this belief without effect upon the rest of the party. Even Bradley felt depressed, though for the sake of the others he managed to hide it beneath a show of confidence he was far from feeling. And on the following day William James was killed by a saber-toothed tiger, September 13, 1916. Beneath a jara tree on the stony plateau on the northern edge of the Stolu country in the land that time forgot, he lies in a lonely grave marked by a rough headstone. Southward from his grave marched three grim and silent men. To the best of Bradley's reckoning they were some twenty-five miles north of Fort Dinosaur, and that they might reach the fort on the following day, they plodded on until darkness overtook them. With comparative safety fifteen miles away, they made camp at last, but there was no singing now and no joking. In the bottom of his heart each prayed that they might come safely through just this night, for they knew that during the morrow they would make the final stretch, yet the nerves of each were taut with strained anticipation of what gruesome thing might flap down upon them from the black sky, marking another for its own. Who would be the next? As was their custom, they took turns at guard, each man doing two hours and then rousing the next. Brady had gone on from eight to ten, followed by Sinclair from ten to twelve. Then Bradley had been awakened. Brady would stand the last guard from two to four, as they had determined to start the moment that it became light enough to ensure comparative safety upon the trail. The snapping of a twig aroused Brady out of a dead sleep, and as he opened his eyes he saw that it was broad daylight, and that at twenty paces from him stood a huge lion. As the man sprang to his feet, his rifle ready in his hand, 
Sinclair awoke and took in the scene in a single swift glance. The fire was out, and Bradley was nowhere in sight. For a long moment the lion and the men eyed one another. The latter had no mind to fire if the beast minded its own affairs. They were only too glad to let it go its way if it would. But the lion was of a different mind. Suddenly the long tail snapped stiffly erect, and as though it had been attached to two trigger fingers the two rifles spoke in unison, for both men knew this signal only too well, the immediate forerunner of a deadly charge. As the brute's head had been raised his spine had not been visible, and so they did what they had learned by long experience was best to do. Each covered a front leg, and as the tail snapped aloft, fired. With a hideous roar the mighty flesh-eater lurched forward to the ground with both front legs broken. It was an easy accomplishment in the instant before the beast charged. After it would have been well-nigh an impossible feat. Brady stepped close in and finished him with a shot in the base of the brain, lest his terrific roaring should attract his mate or others of their kind. Then the two men turned and looked at one another. "'Where is Lieutenant Bradley?' asked Sinclair. They walked to the fire. Only a few smoking embers remained. A few feet away lay Bradley's rifle. There was no evidence of a struggle. The two men circled about the camp twice, and on the last lap Brady stooped and picked up an object which had lain about ten yards beyond the fire. It was Bradley's cap. Again the two looked questioningly at one another and then simultaneously both pairs of eyes swung upward and searched the sky. A moment later Brady was examining the ground about the spot where Bradley's cap had lain. It was one of those little barren sandy stretches that they had found only upon this stony plateau. Brady's own footsteps showed as plainly as black ink upon white paper, but his was the only foot that had marred the smooth, wind-swept surface. There was no sign that Bradley had crossed the spot upon the surface of the ground, and yet his cap lay well toward the center of it. Breakfastless and with shaken nerves, the two survivors plunged madly into the long day's march. Both were strong, courageous, resourceful men, but each had reached the limit of human nerve endurance, and each felt that he would rather die than spend another night in the hideous open of that frightful land. Vivid in the mind of each was a picture of Bradley's end, for though neither had witnessed the tragedy, both could imagine almost precisely what had occurred. They did not discuss it, they did not even mention it, yet all day long the thing was uppermost in the mind of each, and mingled with it a similar picture with himself as victim should they fail to make Fort Dinosaur before dark. And so they plunged forward at reckless speed, their clothes, their hands, their faces torn by the retarding underbrush that reached forth to hinder them. Again and again they fell, but be it to their credit that the one always waited and helped the other, and that into the mind of neither entered the thought or the temptation to desert his companion. They would reach the fort together if both survived, or neither would reach it. They encountered the usual number of savage beasts and reptiles, but they met them with a courageous recklessness born of desperation, and by virtue of the very madness of the chances they took, they came through unscathed and with the minimum of delay. Shortly after noon they reached the end of the plateau. Before them was a drop of two hundred feet to the valley beneath. To the left, in the distance, they could see the waters of the great inland sea that covers a considerable portion of the area of the crater island of Caprona, and at a little lesser distance to the south of the cliffs they saw a thin spiral of smoke arising above the treetops. The landscape was familiar. Each recognized it immediately and knew that that smoky column marked the spot where Dinosaur had stood. Was the fort still there, or did the smoke arise from the smoldering embers of the building they had helped to fashion for the housing of their party? Who could say? Thirty precious minutes that seemed as many hours to the impatient men were consumed in locating a precarious way from the summit to the base of the cliffs that bounded the plateau upon the south, and then once again they struck off upon level ground toward their goal. The closer they approached the fort, the greater became their apprehension that all would not be well. They pictured the barracks deserted, or the small company massacred and the buildings in ashes. 
It was almost in a frenzy of fear that they broke through the final fringe of jungle and stood at last upon the verge of the open meadow a half-mile from Fort Dinosaur. "'Lord!' ejaculated Sinclair. "'They are still there!' and he fell to his knees, sobbing. Brady trembled like a leaf as he crossed himself and gave silent thanks, for there before them stood the sturdy ramparts of Dinosaur, and from inside the enclosure rose a thin spiral of smoke that marked the location of the cookhouse. All was well, then, and their comrades were preparing the evening meal. Across the clearing they raced as though they had not already covered in a single day a trackless primeval country that might easily have required two days by fresh and untired men. Within hailing distance they set up such a loud shouting that presently heads appeared above the top of the parapet, and soon answering shouts were rising from within Fort Dinosaur. A moment later three men issued from the enclosure and came forward to meet the survivors and listen to the hurried story of the eleven eventful days since they had set out upon their expedition to the barrier cliffs. They heard of the deaths of Tippett and James, and of the disappearance of Lieutenant Bradley, and a new terror settled upon Dinosaur. Olson, the Irish engineer, with Whiteley and Wilson, constituted the remnants of Dinosaur's defenders, and to Brady and Sinclair they narrated the salient events that had transpired since Bradley and his party had marched away on September 4th. They told them of the infamous act of Baron Friedrich von Schoenvorts and his German crew, who had stolen the U-33, breaking their parole and steaming away toward the subterranean opening through the barrier cliffs that carried the waters of the inland sea into the open Pacific beyond, and of the cowardly shelling of the fort. They told of the disappearance of Miss LaRue in the night of September 11th, and of the departure of Boland Tyler in search of her, accompanied only by his Airedale knobs. Thus, of the original party of eleven allies and nine Germans that had constituted the company of the U-33 when she left English waters after her capture by the crew of the English tug, there were but five now to be accounted for at Fort Dinosaur. Benson, Tippett, James, and one of the Germans were known to be dead. It was assumed that Bradley, Tyler, and the girl had already succumbed to some of the savage denizens of Caspak, while the fate of the Germans was equally unknown, though it might readily be believed that they had made good their escape. They had had ample time to provision the ship, and the refining of the crude oil they had discovered north of the fort could have ensured them an ample supply to carry them back to Germany. End of chapter 1